Hello everyone, I'm Jane Hansen. This week in the arena, forgiveness is at the very heart of Christianity so that we may be cleansed of our sins and also have the opportunity to receive Christ into our lives. We're all sinners in need of redemption. What happens if we refuse to ask for forgiveness or refuse to grant forgiveness to others who have wronged us? And what happens if we've done something for which we cannot forgive ourselves? Joining us now, Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, our regular contributor, Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal at Pathios.com, and our very special guest today, Bobby Petroselli, nationally known speaker and author of several books, including 10 Seconds Can Change Your Life Forever. And we're going to start with Bobby because that is exactly what happened to you. Tell us your story. Well, Jane, I was married, um, happily married for about two and a half years, living just south of Houston, Texas. I was working as a high school teacher and a coach, um, had just moved into my very first house, didn't buy it at the time, had rented it, had met my wife, Ava, in Texas. I'm originally from Brooklyn, and it's always great to be back in Brooklyn. And um, we were married for two and a half years, and this one Thursday night, I come home from coaching in a football game, talk to Ava a little about the day's events. Um, and usually during football season, we wouldn't get to spend a lot of time together, uh, except, except on the weekends, a little at night, on Saturday night, Sunday morning church, just because of how busy my schedule was. We talk very little about the day's events, about the upcoming days. And this late Thursday night, she goes to bed. I crawl into bed next to her maybe 15, 20 minutes later. And little would I know that I would wake up one hour later. And instead of being in my bed or my bedroom, I'd be sitting in the dining room window, which was the next room over, and I would be staring at a full-size F-150 Ford pickup truck parked in the middle of my dining room, and somewhere under that truck was my wife, Ava. So what happened? A truck literally smashed into your house? While we were asleep, um, a drunk driver traveling approximately 70 miles an hour came speeding into our development. He lived further in the back part of our development. We were the first house. He lost control, swerved over the road into this grass field that preceded my house and at 70 miles an hour ripped through my bedroom wall, ran over me completely. I was somehow miraculously flipped up on the hood of the truck. Truck crashes through the next wall, deposits me in the dining room window where I came to and Ava was buried somewhere under that truck. And your wife was killed in this process. And she was killed. Actually, physically nothing happened to her. The way it was explained to me when the truck landed on her, it knocked all the air out of her body. The sheets in the mattress wrapped around her face and her body simultaneously. She never got another breath of air, and she suffocated. Uh, this, this is one of those horrendous stories where you think, how on earth do you go on with life? Maybe because of the way I was raised, um, I understood from the very start that this would probably be the most difficult thing I could ever dream of facing. But because of the way I was raised, I always understood the essential desire to strive towards or attain towards forgiveness. And the very first night, Jane, I'm laying in my hospital bed surrounded by friends and family members in the Houston area, people from the church where I had attended, and I prayed a very simple prayer that night. I said, Lord, this will be the most devastating thing I could ever dream of facing. Ava's dead for two hours. It still hasn't hit me. But I knew that at that point, I said, somehow, some way, I know you're going to have to give me the strength somewhere down the road to forgive and move forward because that's the only way I'll ever be able to go forward. Well, Monsignor, when you hear this story, and I know you've been called to the sites of many, many tragedies, but... How, how do you even counsel somebody at that moment to say, you have to look forward, you have to believe, you have to have faith? Because I don't know where that comes from. Well, I, you know what, I don't know if you uh, say you have to look forward at the moment, but I think that what you really have to do is just be present to the person. And I think that that's the big challenge. Is, is I think people, uh, they find their way in that regard. What they really need is someone to just be present to them, to hug them, to know that they're not alone, they're not isolated. Uh, and I think that that's the key uh, component for, for we who are religious, is, is that when the tragedy strikes initially, the last thing you want to do is kind of say, oh, you know, start to, to try to, uh, from the outside, a person try to kind of rationalize the experience totally. for somebody. Totally. You want to just be present to that experience with them. So this, the person that the 
there was a man that rammed the, the, the truck into your house. He wasn't injured. No, he had a very small gash on his forehead. That was the extent. Okay, and then he, so he obviously went, went to trial. He was charged, etc. And he didn't spend much time in jail. He was sentenced to 10 years for involuntary manslaughter, was supposed to serve approximately 18 months to three years, and only served four months. And that is the key, though. That is the key about forgiveness. There cannot be a condition to forgive it. I'll forgive if, I'll forgive when, or I'll forgive but. And please excuse the expression. When people will come to me and use the word but, I'll say you got to get rid of your big but. Okay. Because the reality is there can't be a condition. Because then what happens is I, I dealt with a woman one time who had her son murdered. And she had heard me speak and she comes up to me and says, I'm going to prison to visit this man and tell him I forgive him. And if he fulfills these five different criteria that I've yeah, set right. before him, then I'll forgive him. And I said, don't waste your time. She's looking at me like, what are you talking about? I said, if you set a condition and he doesn't meet that condition exactly, you will never truly be well for yourself and never move forward. And people would ask me all the time, but Bobby, forgiving this man would not bring Ava back. You're darn right. Forgiving this man would bring Bobby Petroselli back. And that is vital. Forgiveness never condones wrong. It's a healing that I believe the good Lord has created in all of us. And sometimes the first person we have to forgive is ourself. Isn't it interesting that what you just said, what I think is really fascinating, is, is think about that from God's perspective, right? Is that God doesn't set conditions for our forgiveness, right? That's so right. that yes, when absolutely. we think about that we can't set conditions to forgive other people, God is not setting conditions for our forgiveness, and, and, and that can be very, very liberating and very, very powerful. Uh, so, Bobby, have you ever spoken or physically seen this man? The only time I saw him was the very first night, other than in the house, when he talked to me and said, is there somebody else in the house? And that's when it clicked that, where's Ava? And I was frantically running through the house, trying to lift the truck, trying to find where she might be. But the next time I saw him was with, I guess, an hour or so later in the hospital. He was in handcuffs. And I saw him walk by, and Ava's family had arrived at the time, and I said, that's the man I saw in the house. But I never saw him, talked to him, or addressed him after that. And I always wanted to, but he didn't want to talk with me. And I wanted to let him know that I did not forgive him to condone his wrong, but that was part of my healing process. It would be what Ava would want and I believe, as Monsignor even said, it would believe, I believed it would be what God would want me to do because he knows what's best for me, and that would bring me to be able to maybe move forward eventually. Do you have any idea what happened to this man's life after he got out of prison? Well, what came back to me, um, because it was local and I knew a lot of other people in the area who knew him, they said he, he and his wife eventually divorced, and his three children basically isolated themselves from him and disassociated themselves from him. And my heart went out for him because I truly believe that his ultimate desire that day was not to get drunk and kill an innocent woman. But the reality of when he had his own pain and maybe even his own unforgiveness that he thought alcohol abuse could drown it out, eventually it would bring more problems and more hurt. You, in your book, and you've written several, but in this book about what happened, you say 10 seconds can change your life. And one of the messages I take from here is it was... A 10 second event the reality of him hitting your house so we all make choices about what we do and had that man had the opportunity to not make that choice Ava might be alive you wouldn't have had to go through the forgiveness etc so do you ever think about that of course I mean every day we're all faced with faced with choices and here's where I came up with the whole philosophy about 10 seconds. When I relived the whole tragedy, that it took no more than 10 seconds. But people would say to me all the time, and Monsignor, you alluded to this at the beginning of the program, is that people would say to me, Bobby, take, take this one second at a time. And I'd look at them like, are you crazy? I can't even get through the moment. I'm overwhelmed in this moment. And when I got to do work with 9-11 families, that was probably the greatest compliment they gave to me. Thank you. We found somebody who understands how in the matter of 10 seconds, my life was changed. Yet, I can't get through the hour. I can't get through the day. If I could just make it through the 10 seconds at a time, then before you know it, I have a half a minute. I have a full minute, an hour, a day, and so on and so forth. So... 
I try to teach people and show them that in life, the more we focus on the moment at hand right now and make the best of that moment, then all of a sudden it prepares us for the next moment to maybe be a powerful, exciting, liberating, um, forgiveness-filled, whatever we want to call it, but it could be a moment that could be filled with more hope in life. Mm. Well, we, we want to learn more about how you talk to people and how you've taken this forward. We're going to do that in just a moment. Um, Elizabeth Monsignor and I have a lot of questions for you about all of that. So we're going to take a break, but we want to remind you that you can weigh in in our discussion anytime by going to our website, netny.net, and click on Enter the Arena. We always welcome your questions and your comments. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our discussion on forgiveness. And once again, we are joined by our special guest, Bobby Petroselli, nationally known speaker and author of several books, including 10 Seconds Can Change Your Life Forever. And I really do, Bobby, and I think we all are wondering, again, about where you find the forgiveness at that moment when you need to, because I guess that's... You were talking about 10 seconds and how people needed one second at a time, but how do you get there? Well, you know something, because this is a faith show and what it stands for, here's what I like to come to, a simple understanding in Christianity. The greatest power in the universe is alive inside of me through the Holy Spirit. And I have the greatest resources inside of me to be able to plug into things to help me do stuff that on this earth there's absolutely no way in this world that I could do it on my own. That to me is really what faith says, to help me do things that by myself there's no way I could accomplish and do those things. And I don't know how in the world personally others could have the ability to forgive when somebody has been so wounded or has had detriment brought into their life without the grace of God and the goodness of his Holy Spirit alive in them to work through that situation. Elizabeth, um, you were kind of talking with Bobby about this, this notion of how deeply wounded perhaps the man who drove the truck into the car, into the house was. Yeah, I, I kind of think of everything as being a, a continuum. Somebody hurts me, okay, I, I, and I've hurt people, I'll look back on something I've done and I'll say, well, you know, where did that come from inside of me? And I can find that in my past somebody has hurt me, but I know that person's past. I know where they were hurt too. And you can kind of trace it all the way back. I, I joke with my kids, you can trace it all the way back to Eden and original sin, but it's mm -hmm. true. Totally. And you know what? You, you're recognizing it. That's why we have to separate the action from the person that God created. For some reason, that wound has gotten the best of them. And really, you know what happens? This man who crashed drunk through my house, literally what was speaking for him on that night was his pain. His pain was speaking for him, and then he acted out his pain. And literally, by acting out his pain in that regard... An innocent person was hurt. But once again, I don't believe it was his purpose to want to do that. Sure. But that's a great analogy. We can't control what others do. We can control how we respond to what they do. And how we react to it. But other members of Ava's family had a much more difficult time finding forgiveness. Oh, totally. Ava's dad um, battled alcoholism for probably the next 15 years after this because I think he felt a lot of guilt. He felt that maybe there were things as a father he could have done differently or should have done differently, or probably even some of the guilt that I dealt with, maybe not to his same degree, that I had to forgive myself, like, why didn't I save Ava? Maybe I could have been... Why weren't you killed? Why was she? Exactly. And those type of things. And in some of our discussions, he had alluded to that type of stuff in his own life, that the reality is he had to come to a place to forgive himself for maybe not doing certain things that maybe he should have or could have, but to move forward in his own life. But don't you think that for a parent, you always believe that you can ultimately protect your child? Oh, no question. I, yeah. I mean, even if you can't. And I think parenthood is absolutely fraught with, with self-doubt to begin with. So when something does happen to your child, even if there was nothing you could do for, to prevent it, it brings up everything you ever did wrong as a parent anyway. Yeah. And, and it just becomes like an unrelenting hammer at you. You know, I'm curious, when you think about as a person of faith, uh, you were able to forgive. It took your, your father-in-law 15 years to kind of come to forgiveness. He also was a man of faith. 
I mean, maybe you can explore, like, you know, some, sometimes I think there are probably a lot of people who are watching us, right, who have had these core wounds in their life, and, and they just can't forgive, and they feel guilty that they can't forgive. I, so it's almost a perpetual cycle. They, they know they've been wounded. They know they should forgive. They can't forgive. Why can't I forgive? Do you know something? I, I, I truly believe, Monsignor, if every one of us right now had our lives relived before us, and we look, wondered about all these prayers we prayed and all the things we want to see happen and why they didn't happen. Here's what I believe happens. Is if in my life I'm looking at you, that you are bringing to me the answer to what I need. God's going to use you, but God doesn't always work through the same people. He might work through Liz, but because my attention is so much right here, I might be missing the answer that's right here. I cannot tell you in my travels and in my speaking, I share that so much with my audiences about embracing the life of every moment because you'll never know the things you have prayed for or desired or wanted to see happen. Maybe Jane was the answer to my prayer, but for some reason I was so locked into hatred and bitterness and anger that I missed the opportunity for maybe a change to take place okay, right now. So how do you how do you figure that out? I think How do you figure out what you're missing? No 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 question. For me from a faith aspect, to me, one of the greatest scriptures that I have ever read is found in the Psalms. Be still and know that I am the Lord. And we were alluding to it before about the two categories, the category of life and death. I always tell people, if you're motivated by panic, by chaos, by fear, by anxiety, by strife, by worry, by hatred, prejudice, racism, you get the picture. You are never, ever, 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 ever being motivated by the Spirit of God. But if you're motivated by love and forgiveness and compassion and understanding to do the right thing, even when you don't feel like doing the right thing, you are always being motivated by the Spirit of God. So I'm in actually the process of writing a new book to help people understand where the motivation is coming from to make certain choices and decisions. And once again, take it a moment at a time, not a day, an hour, a week, a moment at a time. Why are people afraid to forgive? Because it makes you vulnerable, because it makes you, you put it out there, don't you think? It makes you, all of a sudden, if you no let question. go of that pain, what, that, that, that pain is kind of a disguise. But I think it, it also gets has to define you after a while. Yes, too, yes. If you allow yes. It to. yes. But then here's who something. are you once you've given it up? Yes. The pain of the past, if we don't deal with it, becomes the pain of the present. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the reality with what you're saying. When we don't allow that to happen, okay? I think it goes to a deep core issue. God, does he really, really love me? Am I really valuable? Was I really made in his image? Am I really special or, or wonderful? And in the back of people's mind, I think unforgiveness becomes a self-defense mechanism. If somebody is not already feeling confident in their skin and who they are, then in other words, Liz did bad to me because I'm a bad person. So therefore, my unforgiveness towards Liz becomes a self-defense mechanism of me trying to convince myself I'm not a bad person. It, it becomes a sick, sure. crazy Don't you cycle. Think that some of this really comes down to knowing who you are yes, as a human being. Totally, knowing that God does love me, adore me, has a purpose. That even though I don't understand all things. I think as Monsignor and I were talking before, understanding the difference of good and evil, that Christ has come to give abundant life. There's a thief called the devil, Satan, whatever phrase people want to use, that is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy at all cost. You know, what? It's, to me what's a little fascinating is, is that what we're, we're really saying is, is that there is a way to be liberated from the pain, but what we're afraid is to live without the pain. Right. That we kind of Absolutely. want the pain oh, to be a part trust of our me, life. I know that feeling. So um, I guess what the one thing I wanted to talk with you, Bobby, before we have to leave here is the work that you did with the, with the no victims of 9-11 because that's, I mean, one-to-one -one is the tragedy that you went through with the 9-11, the you're dealing with this, I, this notion of terrorists and people coming from someplace else who hate us as a people. And that that is a different... I mean, it just, it seems like it's a, it may be the same thing, but it seems larger. And how do you help them? While I was speaking to a 9-11 group not many years ago, still trying to recover and get through this, an elderly woman comes up to me and puts her fist in my face. She goes, how dare you ask me to forgive those people for what they've done? And I said, the terrorists from 9-11, she goes, no. 
And then all of a sudden she rolls up her sleeve. And you can see on her forearm, in turquoise numbers, starting to fade away, she goes, I was a survivor of Auschwitz, Germany, and I lost seven family members. How dare you ask me to forgive those people? And I said, can I ask you three questions? She goes, yes. I go, did those people rob from you? She goes, yes. Did those people steal from you? I, she goes, yes. Did those people hurt you? She goes, yes. What are you getting at? I says, you know what's a more sad reality? For the last 68 years, you have allowed those who hurt you and brought pain to you 68 years ago to keep on bringing pain to you every moment, every second, every hour, every day of your life. You've given them permission to rent space in your mind. You've allowed the pain of the past to always stay alive, active, and be the pain of the present. Well, what I would share with the 9-11 family members is, listen, forgiveness, it's okay to be angry from the neck up. Yes, there's injustice that we all see, that it's okay to be angry. The good book says Jesus was angry, said be angry, Righteous. but sin not. It's okay to look at unrighteousness and look at evil and say that's wrong. I'm not going to sit here and patty cake it and play, play that it's okay. But do not allow that unforgiveness to drop into your heart because the moment it does, it destroys. It begins a process of eventual destruction. It's like a seed that has been sown that will eventually come to harvest. And that harvest is death and destruction of families, marriages, relationships, life in general. Unforgiveness, there's nothing good ever comes out of it. So the, the, the motto, the sign over Auschwitz was work makes freedom. And the truth is forgiveness makes freedom. Excellent. Forgiveness makes Excellent. freedom. If there's Excellent. nothing else we have taken away from this today, Bobby, yes. that would be it. Yes. We thank you so much. Thank you. This book, 10 Seconds Will Change Your Life Forever. You're writing a new book called? Choose Life. Choose Life. I can't wait to read it. Thank you, Bobby, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. We will be back to wrap things up here in just a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. Continuing our conversation on forgiveness, we are joined once again by Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our regular contributor is Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal at Pathios.com, and Grant Galicho, Associate Editor of Commonweal Magazine. Grant, you've been listening to this in the studio. What is your reaction to Bobby's take on forgiveness and what he's experienced? Two, two things came came to I mean, it, it's a it's a powerful testimony that that he has. I'm not I don't know that I have that within myself that that kind of strength. But two two things came to mind. The, the first is, what does it mean to forgive something that hasn't that that someone hasn't uh, apologized for? Mm -hmm. Is is forgiveness pure gift, or is there something you know? Are, are there two poles to it? The other thing that came to mind is you know. How does one forgive God? How, how does one, you know, someone who, who believes in God, who believes that God acts in the world, how do you make sense of that? You know, how do you, and I think of the Lamentations. I think, you know, what, when God steps back, is it proper to be upset with him? I I'm think senior, and for I you. expect you to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it is okay for us to be angry with God, right? I think that, uh, you know, when, when there's illness in our life or there's uh, someone we love, uh, I think that that, you know, it is okay to be angry with God. The, the question, though, is, is that, uh, is that when you, is, is that if you, because what we're really expressing is a sense of our powerlessness, and we're asking, how could God be powerless? And that's almost like it really goes to the heart of our faith that we we expect that when we pray to God that things are going to change in, in our life. And, and the challenge I think for 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 you, for me, for all of us is really to see that somehow that God uh, tolerates sin, because as Elizabeth was saying in the earlier sec uh, section, it was re it really is the consequence of sin. But but what God always shows is that He overcomes sin. And uh, maybe for you or for me, we don't kind of, w we can't see how sin is being overcome in our life, how the glory of God is being manifest. But what we believe fundamentally in the season of Lent specifically is all about it, is that the cross is an experience of sin, right? It's the scandal of the cross, right? That God's son is crucified, that this is a sinful thing that happens. And yet, uh, it's also the moment 
where God's glory is made manifest. And so for you or for me, maybe we can say, we don't want to go to the cross, and I'm angry about having to go to the cross. And I can't help but think that Christ himself was feeling these experiences in the garden. And yet, once the work of redemption is accomplished, right? Once Christ is crucified, God's glory is made manifest. Well, that, okay, but to your point about reparation, mm -hmm. because forgiveness is three parts, right? It's got the repentance, yeah. the admission, and the reparation, and making up or atoning. Where is that in this, and does that have to happen before you can truly forgive somebody? And we only have think, two minutes, I so. don't think you have to have the repentance. I mean, I've forgiven people in my life who have, you know, I've never gotten an apology for. I don't think you really need to have that. I think all you need to do sometimes is realize that there's a crucible. Everybody gets a turn in it. And, um, you know, if you can look at it that way, then you can say, all right, this is my turn in the crucible. I'm going to get past this on my own. And I'm going to get past this, when, speaking only for me, by looking at the crucifix, which is what Monsignor was just talking about. I'm going to look at that God who knows what it is to be in the crucible. And, and, and has shown me, came to earth to show me that, get through that crucible, live through it, and there's glory beyond it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think this problem goes to the heart of our concept of God. You know, it's, it's, it's very powerful to, to think of Christ crucified, to see a God who suffers with us. But the, the question beyond that is, what can God do? You know, it, 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 do, do we blame God? Can we blame God? It's a, well, it's know, when a, he, it's when a, it's Bobby a, was talking, what I kept thinking of was the Pope going to the jail cell, uh, Pope John Paul going to the jail, jail cell of the, the man who shot him mm -hmm. and, and just saying, I, I, dude, I forgive you, <laughs> or, or dude, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, it, it, we had a fine example there on the Holy Father and really it's, it's, it sums up everything, all we can do it's all if we we're can going do. to keep and going. I'm going to leave the last word with you, Monsignor. I, I think that one of the reasons why Job resonates with so many of us is because I think that we can all feel a little bit like Job and uh, that we experience suffering in our life, and yet we can't, and we can't sort of understand suffering. But ultimately, what makes Job the just man, right, is that he ultimately says, uh, the Lord can work in power in my life, and what good comes from the Lord, bad comes from the Lord, all things are blessed. And Monsignor, we're going to allow that to be the last word. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you all for joining us. And remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We are always online at netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. We'll see you next time in the arena.